Hello, Dr. McManaway. Thank you for joining us on Wisdom Keepers. Yay. <laughs> um, Pleasure. Very nice to have you. And for those that don't know very much about you or, or may not be familiar with your work, I have a little bio here I'd like to read about you that I pulled off of your website, by the way. Um, Dr. Patrick McManaway is a third generation practitioner of the psychic and healing arts, working with people, projects, businesses, and places. His services include earth energy balancing, and earth acupuncture for geopathic stress remediation, and spirit release and space clearing for the site energy enhancement. Patrick also engages in traditional and shamanic healing practices and loves to lead firewalking events. I would like to talk about that. Um, <laughs> training first with his parents and at their healing and teaching center in rural Fief, yeah, Scotland, um. Did I say it right? Five. Five. Okay. Patrick graduated in medicine. This is where the doctor comes from. Yes. Edinburgh University before taking apprenticeship in both Western and Eastern approaches to traditional geomancy and working with landscape and energy. He's also the author of several books and CDs, including The Practical Guide to Dowsing, How to Harness the Earth Energies from Health and Healing, Cultivating the Light Body, and Keys to Grace. And you've been in practice since 1994. Patrick consults and teaches worldwide with regular visits to the UK, US, and Australia. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Yes, I, I, I want to hear a little bit more about this fire walking. <laughs> <laughs> did you still do that or have you post COVID pre COVID? I mean, did you uh, do <laughs> all, all, all it takes is a fire and bare feet, Melinda. Yeah. <laughs> um, most, most excitingly, my daughter who's currently 19 just took her fire walking instructor training certification a couple months ago. So she's, she's joined the family, the family tradition. Her mother was my fire walking instructor. Okay. Um, oh so, my. Well, a hundred of them or more. Great fun. Oh, it sounds like great fun if you really know what you're doing. <laughs> so I, I, I'm so glad to have you. Um, I want to get a little bit into a little bit of your background so that people have a little bit of story about you and how you came to geomancy and the work that you do. Um, how did you first get into dowsing? Um, so my journey with this, Melinda, I, I, I simply joined the family practice. My mother was an um, intuitive, natural-born healer, uh, was the person who you'd take your sore head or sore shoulder or sick animal to uh, always. And then my father had a bit of a dramatic experience, age 19 as a a junior uh, military officer uh, fighting a rear guard action at Dunkirk mm. um, and discovered a healing gift. Uh, they had nothing else to do except put hands on on um, uh, wounded people around them. And so um, both parents very committed to healing and what came to them through that in terms of mediumship and dowsing and um many and various things and in the uk they were restricted under the mediumship laws until uh the early 1950s uh but they set up a, a healing center to train healers and mediums in 1959 in rural scotland and um it was sort of they weren't really part of the new age because they were very traditional old age but um, it was sort of the beginning of, of what we experience now as a sort of cultural norm. But um, so I got to grow up in a, a space where conferences and workshops and all kinds of people from all over the world interested in um, dowsing and mediumship and spiritual uh, this, that, and... Um, what we now consider sort of alternative integrative holistic therapies all being shared and explored 
very stimulating dynamic. So I really just joined the family practice. Oh, <laughs> how blessed is that? That's what amazing. Very imaginative. <laughs> yeah, no, but but what's really interesting about that too is that you decided to go into Western medicine. You you studied. You went to medical school. Yes, well, that was very much. Um, I think if 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 one is sort of serious about holism, whatever that means. Uh, then obviously we need to inform ourselves about, you know, all 360 degrees of the circle and um, made a lot of sense to understand anatomy, physiology, health, healthcare, you know, hospital work, birthing and dying and, and all such. Um, so, you know, regardless of paradigm or whether you choose a an acupuncture needle or a a pharmaceutical um it's sort of all the same stuff really so that was a great privilege to be able to really uh dive deep into did you uh, practice did you practice as a doctor um i did just a couple of years um as a junior in in hospitals um getting my license and and getting familiar with the system i i wanted to move into the work that i do now so i uh, I didn't spend extended time, but I I got to see missionary work in Africa and busy district general hospital work in Scotland, various places, including the Orkneys, oh. uh, which was lovely. Oh, uh, I bet. There amongst the stone circles um, that then became more and more part of my life <laughs> in the work that I do now. So you were led to those places through the medical um, path, and there you were. Wow. And you were there among the sacred stones and and lands. Yeah. Um, I think you are familiar, um, certain parts of Europe, and I think the UK has about a thousand still uh, megalithic monuments, what we would call stone circles, sacred sites, various um and Orkney's very rich with those. Mm. And um, I, I would say particularly that was my, I was coming from a place of healthcare and working with geopathic stress mm. and what might make a person sick in a house. And I think um, the opportunity to be in the Orkney's and in the studies I subsequently took uh, here in Vermont um brought my attention to that this was a technology to make things thrive mm. and to enhance agriculture, to optimize dwelling circumstance, to optimize our relationship uh, with our world around us, um, that of the elemental and nature spirit, uh, as well as the angelic and ancestral, and just uh, what riches really um are, are there in those relationships uh for us so it seems to me like you were introduced to these other angelic and elementals at a very early age whereas some of us come to them maybe a little later <laughs> you know it, you were introduced to that then you went to a western medical concept and then you came back and merged the two which is quite brilliant. And then moving from working with humans to land. Well, what was that? Whoa. <laughs> you, know, you said, okay, I'm done with that version. And now I'm going back to <laughs> the, to look at geomancy and. Uh, the honest truth. Um, humbly. Um, uh it's so much easier to work with plants and animals <laughs> uh, than with people. They, they just respond in the most beautiful way. <laughs> they're, they're not invested in, in any kind of residual pathology. <laughs> um, so slightly it's easy work. Um, uh, but yes, and also personally, I... I when I went through medicine, we were doing 120 hour weeks. Um, and uh, 
I, I got super clear that I didn't want an indoor job ever again in my life. And so there was probably a bit of reaction there as well. But um, no, I think um, there's really no difference at all between working with a person, place, plant, animal, project, uh, because everything that's in anything is one of the same things. Uh, the toroidal field, the bagel, um, whatever we call it, um, it's totally fractal. And so if you're anything, you're another one of the same that everything that anything is, is. And so yes. it, it transposes completely across scale. So that was one of the things that I learned because my, my parents in their healing center, they were working with people, but also with places and um, uh, deeply connected with plants. And it was apparent that uh, there was a very simple story, as you know, um, you know, love, rapport, connection, communication, take it from there. And it really doesn't matter whether you're talking to your cat or your wheat field or your, you know, companion angel or the spirit of the community scale is completely immaterial it's just a question of finding a way to engage our mind uh in a, a creative and you know productive and ultimately happy for everybody way so um so i love working with landscape um i love being outdoors i love i love to travel um it's especially um just in the process of sort of bringing this work to the attention of the public. Um, it's been a real privilege for me to work with the farming community because in that context, uh, literally everything is weighed and measured. Mm -hmm. And so if you bless the field of carrots and you get a 30% yield increase, you know, that's sort of logged as that was a useful thing to do. Let's do it again. And, if it works again, let's find ways to do it better. Yes. And so it sort of takes it out of the abstract and the circumspect and the speculative. Um, a lot of my work is with domestic uh, folk because I'm, you know, sort of healthcare based. I, I do geopathic stress and ghosts and mm -hmm. curses or sadnesses or badnesses in people's home. That's sort of just a lot of what, the service is required for people. Um, and that's very, um, that's very lovely work to be able to provide. Um, but certainly in terms of, you know, are we, are we thinking abstract thoughts or are we really grounded in reality? Uh, the agricultural work I've been able to do is, has really supported and facilitated not just the experience of having the results, but then working with farmers over, you know, multiple seasons, multiple years, mm. just refining that. And actually, when do you need to bless what? Um, you know, one of the obvious things is you really want to set the field up before you plant the seeds. Um, once germination happens, you're into the cycle. So just in terms of, the timely aiming of one's love, uh, as it were. Um, yes. As, yes. As, uh, learning to do it better by observation and reflection of, <laughs> of what happens. That's so true. That's so true. The weights and measures is so true. I find sometimes in the work that I do that, that it, you know, it's mostly my own empirical data and, um, I'm just a part of the journey of of what of their path, and and I can't be attached to the outcome of what comes about. I just wanted to mention that because what I've noticed in watching your videos and observing your work is that you bring a a tremendous wealth of compassion and love to what you do. So compassion and love is sort of the bottom line, I would say through the techniques, you know, once you figure out what your techniques are, then you, I would assume. That's 100%, 100%. Yeah. 
in agreement with you, Melinda. I, I, I think honestly, uh, techniques at the end of the day, they're, they're to whatever degree they're necessary, they're necessary as a framework for the mind randomly but always very informative to me um uh, in the 1970s um they got clever enough to start measuring brain waves and there was, there was an oxford team that you may remember or generations of maxwell cade and jeff blundell um and they created the mind mirror and i was exposed to it because dad was one of their um one of their subjects and uh, it was a bit beastly you know with sort of sticky electrodes 20 of them on different parts of your head and, and you had to <laughs> wash your hair afterwards which probably freaked me out a bit as a 10 year old anyway there you go uh, the traumas of having medium <laughs> mediums and healers for parents um anyway uh so you're probably familiar with the work and it's it's well available and it's it's moved into you know generations from but um they were measuring beta alpha theta delta and they were measuring left and right and it seemed that um the sweet spot uh, and the place that people went to whether they were doing their yoga or their healing or their meditation or their whatever was um uh, bilateral hemispheric integration and I think it was unromantically called state five or something but it was the moment when all of your Christmas tree lights were lit up both sides of the brain all together so you weren't distracted into a somewhere else space or compromised into a 3D it was it was a uni yes. verse of yourself and um just in terms of context then. So what they found, um, because they did a a series of studies on healers and what was, pardon me, happening between the healer and the healee, as it were, when that was happening. And what they observed was um, the healer would go into this state five and their Christmas tree lights would go up And then the person they were working with would go into the same space. And then once the job was done, however long that took, a minute, half an hour, uh, the person being healed would come out of that state. And then after a few moments, the healer would come out of it. So uh, just in terms of context of understanding, in terms of protocols, or is it really just rapport? Um. That was instructive to me um, just to see it was it was literally a vibrational space that the healer was holding that the person was then able to phase and train with, I guess would be our contemporary language. And in that phase and trained gray state, everything got sorted out and the job was done. Um, mm. um I just share one other thought about this because I, I I do think you know the more we do this, um, it really is just about rapport and love and compassionate witness, uh, compassionate witness. Um, so um, so just one random personal. I'm I'm in front of the fire. Um, my mother and Labrador's um, open fire. She's got a whiskey. She's got a Labrador in her lap. Um, she's been healing for 60 years and she's done the radionics and she's done the chiropractic and she's done this and that. And she's kind of gone generic and gone bush as she's aged. And, um, and so there was somebody there who was very enthusiastically telling us about the next protocol or, you know, technique of healing and, uh, mom smiles and nods and she takes a a sip of a whiskey and she strokes her Labrador and she says, I wonder how many words we're going to come up with for love. (laughs) 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 That's so true. That's what I've got, Melinda. I think that's brilliant. 
I think it's the back of the door and any kind of protocol is probably just a medium through which the mind can work. Yes, I think that's true. And something for which the other, the Healy, if you were, can grasp, if you will, with their mind that something's actually happening to them. They feel it. It's like feel- it, it's like being in a crisis moment and finding somebody to give you the best hug ever. And yes. You know, everything's fine. You just need to reset. It's it's one of those, isn't it? So, I, I, yes, it absolutely is. And I wanted to talk about your diagram, your logo that's on your website, where you talk about the field. There's a f- there's a field. So you're standing in the in the middle of this field, and then there's this energetic bubble that comes around. And you talk about how you resonate from the heart out, right, to this field. It looks like a a globe with a person in the center you know yeah and how that um how that works what we're looking at um is what's called a toroidal field and it's like a bagel and it's the magnetic field uh that surrounds a nine volt battery um it's the magnetic field that surrounds a magnet on the high school physics bench with iron filings. It's it's the natural shape um, that occurs when you've got a, a polar um, static charge happening. It creates that bagel um, like a slinky uh, wrapped around itself. So um, it's a very simple image that contains many things. Um, so Plato tells us that a gods are numbers and uh, neuroelectric therapy shows us, as does the work we were just discussing, um, that literally our thoughts and feelings are measurable waves of frequency, both in terms of frequency and shape, uh, wave form and frequency defined through amplitude and frequency modulation. So our thoughts and frequent, our thoughts and feelings and consciousness are waves and left to themselves, <laughs> they wave along. And so if you want to be a here and now, Melinda or Patrick, you've got to find a way to make the wave stay here where we are for a while in time and space. And so um, you've got to create a recursive wave um, that recycles on itself and holds its space. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, That toroidal field we see is, you know, insert Vesca Pisces, uh, insert um, Lemnus Gate, um, infinity symbol, you've got to have a recursive field of consciousness in a resonant space to be here now. Otherwise you can be everywhere all the time, but like that. So, so and anything that has localized consciousness with or without a body uh, has to conform to that field form. It's the only self-sustaining field form uh, that we know in the universe, and if I'm wrong, I apologize. If it was, if it was, if it's a lie from me, it was a lie to me. <laughs> um, so, what we're looking at is the shape of everything that sustains itself at one point. And so, you know, possibly fantastically, um, you know, man is made in the image of God. Uh, God has to be that shape so does everybody else if they want to be anything at all. So there's a universality and a fractality of consciousness um, where we see that, in fact, we literally all are just, you know, bubbles in the ocean where toroidal fields um, whizzing around, interacting with each other. And the the central core is where the density is, where the field is compact enough 
to hold physical perceptible form and then you know you and me our visual spectrum doesn't allow us to see the aura which is just that bit some people do or in some times of day or with the right kind of mushroom you do see that um but it's there anyway and we find that and perceive it and work with it and then when we see the fairy when we see the angel when we see the anything it always has a central core and wings so anytime we see a metaphysical being it's always central core and wings we're always looking at a toroidal field so uh one way or another probably um anything that's true for one bagel is true for the next bagel and that lets us transpose you know across all well, it represents a wonderful visual, and I love the image because I think one looking at it, you can really embody that. You can feel it if if one takes the time to really look at it, that they, they can understand what you're saying. They can embody that. And um, so I just thought that was very interesting and um, allows one to ex experience in their own way what you're actually saying by using this image. Hopefully, <laughs> I, 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 if, if it's you know one of the <laughs> as above, so below. Exactly. If, well, you know, it's if, always if nice to have a description. In all dimensions, there's no difference between physics and metaphysics. Yes. It's just a question of what's what's seen or not seen, but yes, there's no there's no sort of special circumstance happening. Right. You know, behind the curtain. Right. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's we are behind the curtain. We're all behind the curtain <laughs> or in front of and behind the curtain. <laughs> oh, yeah. gosh. In a daddy bell of there we go. So, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to switch topics just a little bit here and move towards um, you have some pretty um, amazing stories. And um, I remember hearing one about the um, how you were house clearing helping people um, re resolve an issue within their home. And there was a, um, a maid, Georgina, was it a, a housemaid in a Georgian? Did I get that right? A housemaid in a Georgian house? You're absolutely spot on. Uh, housekeeper, housemaid, Georgian manor, 300 years. Yeah, bless her. And she was still of service there. People would find their shutters and their bedroom completely ready for bed if they hadn't gone upstairs in, in time and things that were lost would be found and put together in pairs like the earring that was lost. I remember this story and you, you freed her, you, you allowed her to move on to other things other than being of service in the house after 300 years, which um, I find fascinating. Um, certainly sort of part of um, there's no difference between healing a person, healing a landscape, except for scale. And um, so you do have to adapt for scale. Um, you know, human being about that size, you know, 70 years plus or minus, certainly they've got scale in terms of past life. And certainly they've got scale in terms of ancestral, you know, so lots of scale that way. But with landscape, um, it's a bit like um, moving from being a, a veterinarian working on cats to somebody working on elephants and lions and tigers because it becomes bigger than you are mm. uh, specifically. And so there are uh, awarenesses and... Um, techniques of leverage, uh, which honestly are just, you know, get into grace, work from power spots and um, get lots of friends and helpers to friendly help you uh, rather than necessarily try and take it on all of yourself. So, <clears throat> so landscape accumulates place memory, uh, sometimes good, bad, indifferent, you know, might include curses, ghosts, massacres, I don't know, suicides, this thing, that thing. Um, but certainly lots include ghosts. 
and um, the ghosts are people like you and me who got caught in their body mind, lower mind, uh, a point of death rather than accessing the freedom of higher mind, soul mind. Because mm. when we're in higher mind, soul mind, you know, we're chatting spirit guides and ancestors yes. lots, even to the extent of, I don't want to know what my mother's got to tell me today. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sure she's right, but I've got to... <laughs> There's lots of advice and support and guidance from from the upper world and uh, the soul mind, the peaceful mind uh, accesses that. The body mind, circumstantial mind is is worried about, you know, appropriate things. Yeah. Um, you know, whether there's potatoes, whether there's beer, whether there's gas, whether there's food. Yeah. Um, so generically, um spirits get earthbound when they die in some process of lower mind reflection and don't make that integrative connection or release into higher mind. So they die and sometimes they don't know they're dead. Sometimes they know they're dead, but they don't know what to do about being dead. Um, those guys are really just sort of confused, a bit disoriented, uh, need a cup of tea, bit of love, um, yeah. job's good um, and then there's a category where um, people have really as with a housekeeper you mentioned um, their whole psyche and consciousness has become identified with the role that they had during their life and then uh, there's another category of folk who um, uh, believe that uh, if they do go across, they'll be punished in some way for something mm. they feel guilty or ashamed about. And those guys need the most amount of extra love and care and help to, you yes. know, we don't want to send anybody into a scary place. If, if love is real, then we need to bring that reality to them. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so what inspires you these days? What what's what keeps you wanting to carry on and do you, and and brings you delight and joy? It's 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 fun it's fun sharing the work and doing the work honestly. Uh the only thing you can do actually it turns out with any kind of useful psychic energy is share it as love. And so <laughs> that's yes. good. Um, well, I was inspired by one of your stories about a riverbed that all of a sudden had water in it. Yeah. And it was the only riverbed in that area that had water come to it. Only, only literally within the boundaries of the property we worked on. Quite extraordinary. And one of several sort of similar circumstances with um, wells filling with water, um, water clarifying and improving its quality. Uh, quite extraordinary. And uh, this was all based on a, bl a blessing system where you used your earth acupuncture or both um it was sort of a consequence of 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 the job on the day um uh the, <clears throat> we were in new south wales um and so there was um work to do with the consciousness of uh indigenous aboriginal mm. um peoples there and their relationship with the water uh, and the current situation with uh, land management and trying to create healing and facilitation and reconciliation and mm. literally miraculously the the dry creek bed filled up with water. That's amazing. <laughs> I I saw the photos and and uh, we will show the photo. That was amazing. Quite amazing. But I I've I've um. Yeah, I've become familiar with wells 
filling up with water, water increasing its quality, mm. stock and plants responding differently. And, you know, this isn't anything new. Uh, as you know, Melinda, unfortunately, uh, God still our best ideas thousands of years ago. So yeah. we're recycling good ideas on her behalf. Um, so they tell stories about this, but it turns out we can we can do it ourselves and tell our own stories and nothing more thrilling really than seeing an increase in productivity and, um, you know, fertility in landscape. That's And the joy of that, that it brings to the farmer. Yes. We live on and for. I love that. Uh, I just love it. So one last question, I guess, is, um, you know, we've kind of talked about, I look, well, maybe we haven't, we can touch upon what you found challenging, you know, what have you found challenging in your field? Um, so the most challenging thing for me, uh, has been to find, um, the right words and language, um, and metaphors to articulate and share and, uh, connect. <clears throat> um, I think culturally, historically, the sort of stuff we're talking about today was always central to everything. And at some point, uh, for reasons various and nefarious, it becomes marginalized. Uh, but then, then it, it leaves us without an ordinary language to talk about ordinary things. Mm. And so I'd say that's that's been my my most challenging part of the journey is um, finding the right words to communicate. Um, and again, sort of coming back to the farm stuff, you don't need to talk about it if it was an increase in yield. It's just sort of, you know, you don't need to describe or justify. It's just bless this, you know, see that, move on, bless again. So no, and I think probably a lot of people of our generation um particularly have had that journey uh maybe it's an easier language map now maybe those blessed to be younger than we are <clears throat> this isn't a big deal it's just ordinary in their lives one would hope we would hope that to be true what we've been planning yeah. and hoping for but right. fi finding ways to communicate effectively and simply and authentically with that you know triggering judgments or mm. that I'd say is that's, that's a bit of a holy grail. Yes. I agree. You're obviously far beyond with your wonderful series of interviews. Melinda. Oh, well, thank you for thank granting you for this. Me, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had so much fun speaking to you about these topics. Um, I, I love diving into the deep end of the pool in terms of these kinds of discussions because it it brings up food for thought for others maybe they hadn't thought about something or or even myself you know to see a, a dry riverbed all of a sudden filled with water it brings home to me that concept of you know you can do this and more and how do we get there without with the humility and grace and uh, reverence and understanding that that can happen without the ego being involved. It's, it's, it's the most utterly humbling thing I've ever experienced. These, these kinds of, I've, I've got to experience like that. Uh, I don't know. I, I see cool things lots, but I've, I've, I've seen a sort of handful of what I would legitimately call miracles. And it just leaves me sort of humbled and close to tears for somewhere between 24 and 72 hours because you know that it's some act of grace uh, beyond ourselves and that we're the recipients of divine love. I, yes. I, 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 I have no other conclusion than it. Did you feel like you had to go through a series of understanding that you are part of that divine love, like learning, understanding, you know, when we say love yourself, 
I think there's a element to understanding what loving yourself actually means in order to facilitate those types of miraculous happenings. You know, all of the traumas that we went through from our childhood or traumas that we went through with others or, you know, getting getting all of that out of the way to be the purest sense of who we are in order to allow these things to come through takes practice. <laughs> A lot of practice. <laughs> uh, I think probably to, to be ascended masters and mistresses, um, uh, I wouldn't want to put myself any kind of pedestal um, in my experience. Uh, you do got to hit that gray spot, but honestly, you might only need there be there in that second. Mm. Um, it's not like you've got to, I don't know, maybe I'm telling you secrets that I shouldn't share with your audience, but um, for the connection to arise, it's it's qualitative, not quantitative. And so it might just last for a moment, but all of your love and all your intention can be through a moment. And honestly, on a job, I might take half a day to end up meditating just for, you know, a few minutes. And mm. inside of that, there's a 30 or 90 second window where, you know, there's just pure connection because it, it moves at the speed of thought. It's not like you got to read them up an essay about what you were thinking about. Oh, I know. see. Yes, that's right. I, I find that the time, the time is taken for the personal understanding and awareness of reflection. Uh, once we're ready to communicate is literally instantaneous. And you, you know, as a practitioner, you, 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 you don't, you don't got to hold that pirouette poise for too long. You right. Know. Right. It's, it's lovely to be there. And I think the more we get to spend time there, the happier we are. But I don't think we want to think we need to be special or spend years in a cave in order to make the connection. Mm -hmm. um, it's natural. It's inbuilt. It's authentic. And it, you know, all it takes is a moment of sunlight um, between doing the dishes and picking the kids up from school. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's instantly there for all of us if we just uh, give our mind to it, I think. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for granting this interview. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be connecting with you. And um, I, I just, I'm humbled and honored and thank you again. Um, we'll uh, say goodbye now. Um, so thank you, Patrick McManaway. And if they'd like to find you, they can find you at your website, patrickmcmanaway.com. And we'll put a visual of that. Um, are you accepting any other form of communication? Um, easiest to reach me through, through email, um, as, as for the website, patrick at patrickmcmanaway.com. Okay, and we'll put that up as well for you. Thank you again, Dr. Patrick McManaway, for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you.